Hello, it's Richard Piers from Finextra TV, uh, and I'm joined today by Simon Zadek. Um, we ran a fantastic uh, event uh, with Finextra TV and Sustainable Finance Live on biodiversity back in May. And so, you know, I'm really delighted to talk to Simon, who's the chair of the Finance for Biodiversity uh, Initiative, the co-chair of the technical hub of the TNFD, and much more. Um, Simon, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Pleased to be here. Well, really thrilled to have you on board and, um, you know, really want to, to learn a lot today about all the work you've been doing for so much time. But tell us, first of all, um, you know, there's so much that you're involved in. It's a key time for biodiversity. What's brought you to where you are today? And, you know, what what is the scope of work that you're covering? Yeah, I've spent, I guess, the last 15 or 20 years focused on one agenda item. Uh, which is how to align the way financial and capital markets around the world work and make decisions and channel resources with a range of sustainable development outcomes. Uh, I guess I've spent in the green space a lot of my time focused on climate up until now, and certainly a lot of the green finance agenda, uh, whether it be you know at a localized level in particular countries or through say G20, uh, taken forward first by China, then Germany, then Argentina, that has tended to sort of equate green somewhat with climate, and in fact, climate somewhat with carbon emissions. So it's a subset of a subset, albeit a hugely important subset of a subset. Uh, and I think we've seen over the past two or three years, so really very recently, you know, a long-standing agenda which is nature and finance, come out of the doldrums and begin to, if you like, go up that innovation curve. Uh, and that's in a sense where a lot of my work over the years has taken place, not so much at later points in the innovation curve where one begins to standardize and harmonize and commoditize the way things function in global markets, but at that point of innovation where really a different agenda can be brought to bear uh, and new markets can be created uh, as well as new forms of behavior really being advanced. And so with um, the, uh, the, F the FNB um, and uh, TNFD, all these, these marvelous acronyms, what, what, are, what are you uh, seeking to achieve with those particular activities of yours? Yeah, so Finance for Biodiversity is a nonprofit foundation funded platform with the single aim of advancing the materiality of nature in financial decision making. And of course, that may be a single aim, but there are many ways in which that can be advanced. Clearly, one part of that, if you like, the foundational piece is to advance the way nature is priced in private financial markets. And the task force on nature related financial disclosure is, if you like, the heartland initiative that is trying to move that agenda forward at scale, much like the task force on climate related financial disclosure launched in 15 by Bloomberg and Carney did for at least the emissions side uh, of the climate agenda. Uh, and then more broadly, finance for biodiversity is pushing along a number of different channels, uh, you know, all intended in different ways to make nature more material. And I'll give a couple of very rapid examples of that just to illustrate, if you like, the diversity. Mm. So in the context of the pandemic, as we all know, there is an emerging market sovereign debt crisis with many, many countries around the world facing you know, catastrophic public financing positions and a real struggle to service their international or indeed their domestic uh, sovereign debt. Uh, and into that equation, we, along with others, have tried to introduce the notion that nature and climate should be part of a debt relief deal, but more broadly, that actually natural capital should really be embedded as a critical element of sovereign debt markets going forward. You know, today, that is not the case, and it's like lending money to a company without a balance sheet. Natural capital is part of a country's balance sheet and so clearly should be priced into sovereign debt more effectively. Our work has pushed a new range of instruments in sovereign debt markets, essentially 
nature performance bonds. So that's nature KPI linked performance bonds and so not use of proceeds bonds, traditional green bonds, if you like. Uh, and that would be an example, not only of a compliance agenda, but also really trying to understand both the risk dimensions and the opportunity side of natural capital in different countries and finding different ways <clears throat> in which that can be priced into one of a number of critical capital markets, in this case, sovereign debt markets. And then a second example at a completely different point in the financial system is the coalition that we have just launched along with the nonprofit organization, the Green Digital Finance Alliance, and a, a, a coalition called Each Action Counts, which is a coalition of mobile payment platforms that are focused on how to bring behavioral change, particularly in citizens' consumption decisions, through the use of algorithms driving information across mobile payment platforms to the user, uh, i.e. the person sitting there using Alipay or PayPal or whatever it happens to be, uh, gamifying that information in order to strengthen social identity associated with green consumption decisions, and in some instances providing sort of concrete rewards over and above identity formation, um, uh, such as, you know, offset tree planting in Inner Mongolia, as in the case of Ant Forest in China, um, in order to try and encourage a billion people yeah, to consume in more green ways. And so those two examples, in a way, illustrate, in essence, the extremes, one being the heartland of international capital markets, sovereign debt markets, mm -hmm. and the other being really our individual financing decisions in the role of consumers. Uh, and it's really interesting because actually the, the workshop that we did, we focused on those two end, ends of the spectrum, if you like. So, so one, we had people like Morova and Federated Hermes um, talking about, you know, how, how do they uh, find large enough, you know, bankable projects? And then how do they actually coordinate all of the different um, entities, um, you know, from the, the citizen that, that may be involved in the land all the way through to, you know, the water company and the city and everybody else? And then on the other end, we had a tokenization project about how can you reworld local farms, um, you know, with tokenization, so allowing the citizen, the concerned citizen, to actually get involved. I think one of the things that that sort of keeps coming across on this, I suppose, and I was interested, we did another session on sustainability linked bonds, um, is you know, one the size. Obviously, we're talking about a relatively small um, uh, scale of things like sustainability linked bonds versus the traditional bond market. Um, so, uh, and the other aspect is is how do you evidence um, you know that the that the instrument is doing what it is uh, it, it sets out to do? Uh, how do you tell that? Can you ensure the consumer that's having that nudge behaviour? that actually, you know, you can see all the way through the supply chain to say that that basket of goods is indeed you know, sustainable, if you will, and you, as you're billing it. So when you, these are all challenges, they're all solvable challenges, but how do you see the, the, the scaling and the uh, evidencing of truth to make all of those markets uh, uh, come to pass? Uh, and, and what is the role of, of your organisations in helping, you know, get that that traceability, if you will. Sure. So, um, uh, so on the on the first, let let's start with going back to the sovereign debt side, and then perhaps I'll give a couple of different examples. Um, the role of KPI linked bonds um, in mainstream markets is, in the main, rather poorly looked at. So, forget about the sustainability agenda. Historically. The World Bank, the IMF, and many other actors have pointed to the hybrid nature of KPI linked bonds. They're sort of part insurance product, part debt product, or you might think of them as a sort of shadow equity product. So you don't actually have ownership of a country, uh, and yet the KPI piece is essentially bringing you into an equity relationship. Quite interesting, really, to look at it through an Islamic finance lens, which is very similar. Um, and so historically, this has not been looked well at by the sort of conventional experts. And I think that moment has changed. So we're seeing 
a raft of material beginning to emerge about the relevance of KPI linked bonds uh, across the international debt markets, including sovereign debt markets. And although the sustainability piece is what we normally look at as our sort of inner community, in fact, there is this broader discussion going on in the context of increasing volatility, largely due to climate, but not exclusively, as to whether traditional debt instruments are going to be the future in funding sovereign needs, or whether in fact, we need to encourage creditors yeah, to extend their risk profile uh, and take some shared risk um, beyond uh, the traditional credit risk that you would take in any uh, sovereign, uh, in, in any debt. Um, and I think the work that we've done, for example, has included specifying what a new generation of nature performance bonds that can be commoditized and scaled could look like. Secondly, we have worked with a wider group of actors in designing a nature and sovereign debt facility, which now the World Bank, the IMF and the OECD is taking forward and will launch at the IMF annual meetings in October. So that's a technical assistance and concessionary financing facility to, if you like, ease the way for this new generation of debt instruments to evolve. Uh, and then thirdly, to your point of traceability, we with others are working with a range of actors both in the biodiversity space like IUCN for example um, in hybrid space like the World Resources Institute or WWF and in sort of hybrid space further into the financial community which includes development finance institutions and organizations like ICMA and IIF and others all of whom are thinking about how to build data rich performance frameworks that would allow, you know, a credible performance model to be attached to something like a debt, a sovereign debt instrument. Uh, I think that works well, but it points to, you're quite right, um, the issue of credibility, yeah, which at some level is unsolvable in an absolute sense. And so one is continually building new ways of approaching trust and credibility, whilst at exactly the same time as we know, there are some dynamics in every market that will lead actors to try and gain that trust and reap the harvest, the economic harvest of trust without actually delivering the goods. So that's a, an ongoing process, not a one off. And I wanted to give an example uh, in another part of our work, which is linked to the task force on voluntary carbon markets which Carney and Withers from Standard Charter have pushed forward and most recently kind of set out a roadmap that was July the 8th um, uh, in how to scale voluntary carbon markets mm. you know, without slowing down or undermining the pace of decarbonization of the corporate community and in a way that credibly invests downstream um, in climate positive or helping towards net zero outcomes whilst taking account, particularly for nature related investments, you know, of multiple potential games that can be played or errors that can be made. And so our work has focused on governance. Mm. Now, there are many other actors that, you know, can model out what a carbon ton is. Um, but what we have focused on is how that initiative might be governed. And we've presented uh, a set of proposals to the task force leadership those proposals are now being taken forward uh, in a sort of subgroup linked to the new board. Um, and they're focused particularly on a more radical approach to transparency, where we have argued that there should be end to end transparency on every transaction. Yeah, which is absolutely not the way not only carbon markets have worked up until now, but in fact, financial markets in the main don't work in that way. It may well be that the regulators can see in the London Stock Exchange, you know, who, who was the buyer and who was the seller. Yeah, but actually with high frequency trading and dark pools and many other facets of modern international capital markets, yeah, even that information is often not available to the regulators. So our first proposal is focused on a radical view of transaction level transparency. And the second is focused on a more strategic approach to building a grievance mechanism that would allow 
a group in Brazil to look at an investment that's being made with carbon offset money to see the fact that there's a leakage or a trick or it's not going to work properly and to be able to raise that in real time, having seen the real time transaction uh, and argue that that is not going to be something that works in practice. Now, these things sound easy on paper, but in practice are really complicated. Yeah, very much. Carbon markets are going to you know, move into secondary markets and derivatives and securitization and will become increasingly complex. And what we need to make sure of uh, is that the governance of those markets maintains the ultimate purpose of creating carbon markets, which is a public purpose, not a private purpose, which is to accelerate the rate of reduction of emissions across the planet. So I think there are many, many initiatives going on to try and secure exactly the kind of trust and credibility that you're describing, and those would be a couple just to illustrate the point. Really, really great response. Thanks. And I think one of the things that our audience will be interested in is that, you know, if you look at the fintech world, competition market authority, open data, and then open banking, moving to open finance, you know, there was this move to try and put a lot of innovation and fintech uh, muscle into uh, accessing data, looking at transaction information, um, and making, you know, that transparent to the to the consumer through lots of different innovations. Do you do you through your you know, opportunity lens, if you like here, um, do you see that the, the world of, of fintech, um, if applied correctly, can, can be part of the solution into this transparency and trust question? So I absolutely do. And I absolutely don't think that's automatic. Yeah, so I don't sit in the evangelical school that says, if you use blockchain, then we have a radical democratic revolution in play. Um, but I do sit within perhaps a more modest community that would argue that the useful application and the diligent application and the politically nuanced as well as technologically smart application of fintech can make a big difference. And I'll give a couple of examples. There is a piece of legislation in the European community. It's already in play. The pension policy holders need to be informed as to what their pension uh, companies um, are doing with their money. So that's that good old, you know, let's tell them that we're investing in this and we're not investing in that and so on. And truth be told, although there is a flow of information that is increasingly targeting that poor pension policy holder that's just trying to enjoy their lives, um, the real responsiveness of pension policy holders is negligible in almost every example. And so FISMA, you know, the equivalent of the Ministry of Finance of the European Commission would be the first to admit that the legislation is on the books, but in practice, it's not being used at all. It's a perfect example of where fintech, smartly connected to behavioral nudging, can make a significant difference. That comes a little bit back to the coalition, each action counts, Yeah, where simply providing more information um, is not going to do the job. Mm. Yeah, and actually the recent report in the UK on food and affordable nutrition by Dimbleby also makes that point quite clearly, which is actually the educational model to improve food nutrition intake has essentially failed, mm -hmm. which is why he obviously proposed um, a, a tax approach which has not been politically um, uh, uh, embraced. But, but actually, there was a third model that he didn't put on the table, which is a behavioral nudging model using fintech and other digital tools. And so actually, if he'd spent more time with the fintech community, Dimbleby might not have been trashed quite so quickly. Uh, and he might have come out with a more sophisticated way of doing exactly what he wanted to do, which is to shape incentives yeah, over and above traditional educational models. And certainly we see fintech, you know, as having a critical role in the behavioral nudging space, um, both at the investor end and also at the consumer end uh, of the equation. And then rapidly in the voluntary carbon market example that I just gave, in fact, blockchain will need to play a critical role mm -hmm. because without putting the whole carbon market on blockchain, Traceability will become almost important, almost impossible. 
transparency will become technically infeasible. And so reasonable grievance mechanisms and ways of challenging you know, the public good associated with particular transactions will not be possible. So you really do need a new technological architecture to make all of that work. So of course, FinTech has an important role in multiple domains, but we shouldn't, as I say, just assume that, you know, mobilizing FinTech innovation somehow automatically serves the public good, which is, of course, complete nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I spoke to the CEO of Plastic Bank, who you, who you may know yesterday, and, and he made the same point. I mean, he loves the technology that he, they use, but he's very clear that there's, you know, the, the people and the process and, and so many other things are more important than, than the technology. Um, but of course, he's he's using that um, that uh, the, the collection of plastic and putting it in through the supply chain and then hopefully evidencing that social plastic is being used in the in the basket of goods by the consumer. You know, all of those things you spoke about is it's an interesting case study. Um, when when you look at the sectors of finance um, that um, are, are going to be the most responsive, you know, they, they've obviously got, you know, they have endless regulation coming their way. They have they have the pressures of, of, of 2008 and now they've got the current you know, COVID crisis. Um, which which CEOs and boards of in financial services are sitting there going, you know, really we've got to we've got to address everything that Simon's been talking about, or otherwise it's, you know, we're we're in big trouble. It's got to be a big priority. Which sector of finance is feeling the pain for it most? Yeah, so so let me slice and dice the question because if one takes it as who cares about nature in the financial community? One sort of ends up at sort of 35,000 feet, you know, with a few folks that are advancing things because they're unusual individuals running unusual institutions. You know, you look at a Morova, you know, coming out of France and they're born to do things differently, but that doesn't mean that every asset manager is doing what Morova is doing or even that they should do what Morova is doing. So let me slice and dice it mm. slightly down. And of course, that will lead it to be a more illustrative answer. You know, if we recognize that food system, you know, a 10 to $12 trillion a year business, you know, in toto, so about 10% of the global economy is the primary interface with nature and a major impactor on climate as a result, um, then clearly we need to think about where finance fits into uh, at scale the transition of the food system to you know more inclusive more sustainable you know you can run through the uh, the various uh, words that seem to fit and as I've made the point before there are many ways in which finance needs to play a role but like solar or more broadly renewables in the energy system we need to think about large-scale financing where technology disruption is part of the solution. And as you know, I've highlighted, amongst other things, the importance of my view of soilless agritech, so alternate protein and vertical farming, not as a technology silver bullet, you know, regenerative agriculture and many other things have their place, but as a fast-track way in which to improve nutritional delivery at a cost that massively reduces its impact on nature and climate, notably uh, the use of water. So there, you're starting really with private equity, although that's already rapidly evolving um, into you know, public listing, uh, project financing, uh, and so on, as particularly vertical farming will be increasingly understood as an infrastructure asset that happens to make food. Yeah, so that's one area. On the mm. other hand, if you're talking about damage to the Amazon and how to deal with that, we're talking about banks and we're talking about institutional investors. Yeah, and so there, let's take the banking community. You know, it may be a very different set of mechanisms. Before I got on this call with you, I was talking to a bunch of super experts focused on anti-money laundering legislation. Yeah, and what we were discussing was whether the way in which AML has been applied to wildlife with modest success could be more extensively applied to environmental crimes in order to, in effect, strengthen the purpose of financial institutions in policing, um, for example, illegal deforestation. 
and with the UK and the US and potentially the EU all poised to launch due diligence obligations to report on deforestation with the corporate community and potentially the financial community, um, the role of unlikely types of legislation like anti-money laundering legislation will become certainly relevant. And then my third and final example, I'm just trying to illustrate the point, is some of you will know, um, you know that there is something called the sort of Global Climate 100, which is a group of institutional investors that have come together as universal owners to influence the 100 most carbon intensive companies that they are collectively invested in. And I think we are about to see the launch of an equivalent in the nature space, yeah, which highlights not only the need, not only to look at climate, but also nature, but also the role of institutional investors, but also other parts of the financial sector working collectively and using their investment power, not only to invest money, but to influence the way in which companies behave. And of course, I close on that by pointing from vastness of institutional investors to the influence that Engine One has had yeah, in its voting around Exxon and its placement of several board directors on the Exxon board. You know, and so point to you know, not only the traditional lending and investing roles, but the role of really financial activism and its increasing place in addressing both climate and nature issues. Thank you. I mean, that's, again, really illustrative. Um, switching gears slightly to TNFD, which obviously you're, you know, you're intimately involved with, Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, you touched on earlier on. Um, I, I think uh, it would be useful for people to try and understand you know, the, the process and the, and the timelines that that's going to work to and, and how you see orchestrating, you know, what, what is a, a big diverse group of people to deliver um, to deliver action, you know, um, it might seem like a talking shop at the moment. How do you get that into something that's delivering practical, um, practical change? Yeah, no, that's that's a fair question and a fair challenge, reasonable challenge. So firstly, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD, understandably focused on encouraging the corporate community writ wide to report um, on risks associated with their impact on nature or their dependency on nature, and particularly with the financial community in mind as um, a, an audience and user of that information. So to say the obvious, but perhaps not obvious to everybody, and really building on the experience of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, but with one or two really important differences. And I wanted just to highlight those differences and then go straight to the question on process and timeline. Um, probably most important is obviously that nature is more complicated than at least carbon um, at the measurement data you know, and risk pricing level. Um, and so we need as the TNFD to address the issue of what, what constitutes nature related risk. How do we understand that? We need to take a different, you know, although consistent approach to the climate agenda, which is a significant reason why it wasn't just add a question of adding nature to climate, you know, climate plus nature equals green, um, but why we, many of us felt that we need a distinct process, not because nature and climate are completely different phenomena, not because financial institutions should manage them in a completely different way, but because there are some measurement issues and conceptual issues that need to be dealt with, with a focus on nature going forward. Um, and probably, the single biggest one is that whereas TCFD started with an exclusive focus on what we have all understood as material financial risk, largely defined as we know now by auditors and lawyers, not by business people, um, that was not going to work in the nature space. And so this broader framework of nature related risk includes material financial risk, which tends to be short term, immediate, but also includes the metrics associated with dependency on nature, so nature dependency and nature risks. Why, a bunch of folks might ask, since private institutions are not responsible for nature impacts per se, I, I think we're not taking the double materiality approach that the EU is taking, impact on society and impact on people, but we're arguing that nature dependency and nature impacts 
are really extending the time horizon around what will all become material financial risks. So this is looking at a broader view of risk um, that allows one to understand transition risk modeling in a more effective way. Where is this going to go and how quickly? Um, we have a two year program of work to work with multiple standards organizations in the disclosure space, so IFRS, SASB and so on and so forth in trying to converge on yeah, a smart way in which to measure and report on nature related risks and their relationship to climate related risks. So it will certainly not just be one, but the relationship between the two. We need to put material out much sooner in order to help the growing number of corporates and FIs that are keen to begin working in this area or are already working in this area and are trying to figure exactly what to do. So we are currently undertaking our first pilot that will deliver a methodology that we will put out there not as any final framework, but as if you like a beta framework that we are going to encourage corporates and FIs to try out, to make use of, and also to provide us with feedback on. There is a chaos of different standards already emerging. So we're at that point in the innovation curve where everything is messy. And so we see our role not to suppress that innovation, but to help it converge as rapidly as possible into simple positions that are relevant to the financial community and the corporate community. And I think the unusual co-chairing model, yeah, which includes David Craig, who just stepped down from his role um, as the CEO of Refinitiv, and Elizabeth Marema, yeah, who is the executive director of the Conference on Biological Diversity. So, you know, within the UN system, I think that unique approach to a co-leadership of this space really speaks to perhaps a next generation of thinking beyond the thinking in 2015 that informed the creation of TCFD. Let me stop at that. And, and just to end, because I think it's, you know, how can people get engaged, perhaps? Um, I think there's a competition uh, or, or something coming out of TNFD, isn't there, shortly, where people can perhaps perhaps see that beta framework and get engaged. Can you can you expand on how people can get engaged? Absolutely. So we are in a, a sort of build out phase. We've just been launched after a long digestion period. Um, there is a technical scope document which already is intended to help um, uh, the market think about this topic as well as inform our work going forward. We're in the process of selecting a group of TNFD members exclusively from the market that we hope will be on us for the with us for the whole journey and will help to lead different working groups. But absolutely, um, there is a much more extensive process that will roll out post September, so after the European summer, that will give all FIs and other market actors opportunities to participate either directly by doing pilots with us, by contributing knowledge, by learning from what we're doing, by trialing documents that we're putting out. I think it will be a very inclusive process, but and I will finish, you know, by responding to the challenge that you put on the table at the beginning of this question. You know, it is very it is run by a group of pragmatists, a group of pragmatists that are saying, you know, we're not writing a PhD. We're not building an international convention. We've got to deliver useful, useful tools to the market. We've got to catalyze the availability of the right kind of data. We've got to engage governments to incentivize the right sort of disclosure. You know, I think there is a deep pragmatism within TNFD that will suit the people that want to get on with stuff. Amazing. Well, look, I feel we could sort of talk around this for many hours, but our time is up. And um, thank you for that. And I do very much hope that you'll come back and sort of give us an update as this uh, unfolds. But for now, thank you so much, Simon. And much appreciated to you.